This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the Merkle Week, a blockchain conference, training seminar, and hackathon taking place in Paris from March 9th to 12th. Learn from leading experts and get certified on building blockchain applications designed to enhance organizational governance. Get your tickets at MerkleWeek.com and use the promo code EPICENTER to get 30% off early bird tickets. And by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to JAX.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we, have, we are glad to welcome Vitalik Buterin back to the show. We'll talk about the DOA folk, uh, Casper, sharding, interoperability, ZK Snarks and the application space of blockchain technology with him. Generally, we have our guests, you know, introduce themselves, but I, I think Vitalik doesn't need an introduction in our space. So I'll probably just dispense with that formality. And uh, perhaps we could just jump in and talk about uh, the, the DO4. So um, the DO attack and the resulting fork of the Ethereum system. So from the outside, like we have all seen what, what happened. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to know what was it like? What were those, What was that month like to be in your shoes, Vitalik? So maybe if you could tell us your version of the story. So um, 2016, June 17th at 3 p.m. local time, I was uh, in Shanghai and it was just uh, another normal day. I was visiting China, talking to a few of our uh, local partners. And at one point I got a uh, message on uh, I, I believe uh, Skype in one of our kind of semi-public uh, uh, Skype, uh, Skype Gitter channels that just said, hey, you know, someone should uh, ch check this out. It looks like so uh, the, the balance of the DAO is decreasing, so uh, someone should check this out. And I immediately went and checked it out, and, you know, the balance said it was a 9.5 million Ether. And I yeah, immediately got concerned. I started looking, and it definitely seemed like Ether was getting drained fairly quickly. So I... Uh, sent off a message to some other people from our team and uh, over the course of about 15 minutes like a couple, uh, uh, Christian, uh, Christoph and a, and a couple other people went in and uh, like, tried to see what was happening and it uh, fairly quickly became clear that like yes this was very very bad and at that point the a fairly large number of people like in uh, the Ethereum Foundation, ETHCore, SLOC kind of came uh, fairly rapidly started and kind of talking to each other and trying to figure out kind of what was going on, what sh uh, was there any way to try to uh, stop the situation, like is there anything that could be done, what, what was happening, what would the consequences be, I don't know, uh, and just like get an idea of everything in general. Um, so. We had about two or three hours uh, worth of fairly frantic uh, calls and uh, Skype discussions. Um, at the end of that, we uh, that first blog post came out where we basically uh, said what had happened. We suggested the uh, soft fork and hard fork strategy. Um, then after that, um, we uh, the Go developers. Uh, started uh, going on going off to actually implement the soft fork and i was uh, kind of trying to be uh, online and like trying to be as helpful as uh, as much as i could but like even still there was uh, there were quite a lot of uh, and there were limits to what i could do personally because i was uh, you know, First of all, like I'm not actually one of the Go developers, and I don't have too much experience with either the language or the client. So that like I've made a, f a few online patches, but I'm not the sort of person who would like actually be able to be the right one to practically implement so, like an actual soft work patch. So I know like Jeff and his team were working uh, fairly hard on that for uh, several days. 
I mean, I, I think like it was the basic kind of scaffolding was done in about one or two, but you know, as usual, they spent uh, uh, quite a bit of extra time test going over it and testing it and making sure everything works well. And uh, that was in parallel, and we were trying to kind of get an idea of what the community thought that we should do. And I remember there were, uh, at least initially, some informal uh, kind of polls that were happening on Reddit. There was also a poll that was uh, happening uh, in the Chinese community. And, you know, being in China myself, I uh, quite a bit ended up uh, kind of passing messages back and forth between like the various different, like the channels on, on WeChat and Reddit and so forth. Um, and like on both sides, it seemed fairly clear that there was uh, at least initially something like 80, 80 to 85 percent support for the soft fork and about 60 for the hard fork. So, you know, we basically took that as, you know, we have a mandate from the community to definitely try a, a kind of any uh, non hard fork routes to uh, resolving the situation if, if uh, at all possible. So, we uh, wrote up the code for the soft fork uh, after about a week, pushed it out. And uh, then at the same time, there was a, a lot of other efforts that were happening with like, developers that were trying to go into you know, like inspect the DAO code, see if there was like some way of counterattacking, try and like figure out all these other like strategies. Can you slow the attacker down? Can you kind of drain the the Chow DAO, can the attacker drain the Chow DAO that you drained and so forth. And the what we figured out basically is that you could potentially have this game, but and if you had the soft fork, then you could prevent the attacker from retaliating until you could win. But without the soft fork, like it was fairly unclear, it was like fairly yeah, kind of unclear, um, especially initially. And like it seemed like it might be possible to just keep the money frozen forever, um, or it might be. Uh, you know, it, there's always the risk that like someone will discover even more bugs inside of it. And you know, me and Grunsi are uh, basically strongly uh, started recommending against trying to kind of play those kinds of complex games, and he started pushing for just you know doing a hard fork and getting a, getting it over with. Then. The uh, the post came out that basically said you know the soft fork was uh, kind of deemed to be unsafe and at that point the soft fork effort was abandoned. Um, it's uh, in parallel. I know the uh, oh, there was that one Chinese team that was uh, working on uh, building Carbon Vote and pushing it out, and Carbon Vote uh, I believe started running at like roughly around the same time as the the soft fork vote uh, the or the soft fork attempt failed. And uh, that was about two weeks in, and after the soft fork uh, failed, there's still about three weeks left uh, for us to do the hard fork. And sort of within that time, people were scrambling to try to uh, figure out the hard fork specification, plan the hard fork, fig like, figure out what the consensus tests are, figure out what else would need to be tested, and uh, do some extra network tests because, you know, you know just a because of the possibility that uh, this uh, this fork would go less smoothly than something like the transition for, for, from Frontier to Homestead. If then, you know, the votes uh, started coming in on Carbon Vote. And uh, I remember on Reddit, it seemed kind of uh, very chaotic, um, at least for myself personally. Um, I mean, I was surprised I actually didn't receive any, like, like serious death threats. I mean, I received a bunch, uh, a lot of messages from trolls, and I still do, but like nothing on the order of you know, uh, like actually threatening to kill me, which is uh, I guess kind of uh, a nice silver lining. Um, then you know, eventually the carbon vote showed that result of about eighty five percent in favor of the fork, and like that's a result that I kind of accepted because it also seems to roughly line up with like a, a lot of the other polls that were happening at the time. So like I saw mining pools were around like 75% in favor. I saw support for the hard fork increased after the soft fork failed. And uh, so I like I I knew that the 
know, a, a strong a strong super majority of the of the community was definitely in favor in, in favor of it going ahead and we uh, uh three days before the uh, deadline so three days before the attacker would be able to make their next move to get to kind of get, uh, get the money out uh, we uh, released the code and people uh, installed the code and uh, i remember when the hard fork was just about to take place we were all in uh, cornell at a, a workshop workshop that we were organizing together with ic3 and uh, a few zcash people were present and at like 9 20 a.m 40 minutes before the first day of the workshop that bl uh, block uh, 1.92 million hit and everything seems to kind of go through smoothly so that was the first part and then obviously three days later the whole like the uh, whole kind of classic uh, side of the situation started to uh, kind of take hold and, and it uh, things kind of continued going from there for a while. So looking back on that, the original promise, one of the original thing was, right, you know, this unstoppable world computer, you know, no censorship, no immutable, you know, there was sort of some of the core uh, promises of, of Ethereum and and, you know, looking back on that today, we have Ethereum Classic, we have Ethereum. I have heard many people say this is, you know, irreparably damaged Ethereum, substantially damaged Ethereum. I'm not sure if I agree with that personally, but I'm curious, what is your point of view? Do you feel like this has done lasting damage to Ethereum? Do you feel like it was mostly just a valuable learning experience and Ethereum is fine? Or how do you, how do you look back on that event? I mean, first of all, I think Ethereum is definitely fine, and I think like outside of a fairly kind of small, uh, you know, group of uh, people that are like really strongly into the sort of purity morality of you know if it's stained once, then it's gone forever. I think like most people are, even people who disagreed with the decision, or m m many of them are kind of fine with it. And I think uh, like over time, they're starting to see that you know the Ethereum. Uh, a kind of a, a governance is uh, st stabilizing more and more and that the project's continuing to move forward. But in terms of kind of less extreme consequences, I think there's uh, quite a bit of good and there's quite a bit of bad. So I would say, yeah, like on the good side, I think the hack ended up doing wonders for the progress of a safe uh, smart contract programming. After that, after that happened, I uh, noticed that you know within the next uh, two months, there were uh, at least five teams that showed up that were all trying out various different approaches at improving smart contract programming safety. Whether it's better languages, whether it's better development environments, whether it's formal verification, you know, it's uh, it really uh, was this kind of big, huge sign to the academic community that basically said, "Look, this problem is real, and you know, there's money at stake." and this is a place where you can contribute, you know, with the knowledge that you've been figuring out over the last 30 years right here, right now. And I think that's something that's getting, that's gotten quite a few people excited. And on the negative side, there was obviously a bunch of PR fallout. Um, I mean, I think obviously on net uh, negative, but I think the great majority of the negativity is attributed to the hack itself and, like, and not necessarily any of the decisions that followed it. So I was thinking at the time, even when it was quite controversial, you know, uh, was this a good thing? Was this a bad thing? You know, some people were saying, oh, it, it sort of damages this immutability idea and stuff. But I, I think if one took a step back and if one, if one isn't so deep in this whole crypto community and looks at this, then it was very clear to me that the fork was the choice that would be looked at more positively than just letting the theft proceed, right? Because otherwise it would have been a huge thing, like another Mt. Gox, 150 million stolen. Like this, it's much more like, okay, community rallies together, undo theft. And that kind of sounds like a good story, right? If you sort of from an outside, I'm like, okay, maybe it's still not so secure, but you know, at least even in this decentralized network, they can come together and do something about something like that. If you believe in like certain kinds of uh, kind of, applied social chaos theory as, you know, at least some kind of modern uh, sort of philosophers trying to explain things like the financial crisis do, then 
you would say that you know a major crisis is in any ecosystem is inevitable and you know you'd also say that you know the facts that our major crisis happened at a time when the community was well coordinated enough to basically like undo uh about like 85 percent of the theft is uh, like actually a really lucky and amazing thing and you know realistically that's not an opportunity that we're likely to have uh, quite so easily in the future Let's take a short break to talk about the Merkle Week, a blockchain training seminar, conference, and hackathon taking place here in Paris from March 9th to 12th. The Merkle Week is organized by Eureka Certification, and it's an event that is designed to help entrepreneurs, developers, and decision makers gain practical experience using blockchain technologies to build distributed governance in their organizations. So it's a four-day event, and it's broken up into two parts. First, March 9th, there's a full day training seminar featuring an impressive list of speakers, including Gavin Wood, William Mugayar, and Peter Todd. You can get the full list of speakers over at MerkleWeek.com. And as an attendee, you'll get to participate in training courses and demonstrations for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And these are designed to help you build and test blockchain applications meant to enhance uh, operational efficiency in your businesses and organizations. Then, over the weekend, from March 10th to 12th, you can put all that knowledge to practical use by participating in the hackathon. And here you're gonna get to work with other developers, designers, and entrepreneurs, and you're gonna come together, and you're going to work on real live Bitcoin and Ethereum applications under the close mentorship of those leading experts. And by the way, there's a 10,000 euro prize for the top three teams in the hackathon. So come join us, come spend the weekend here in Paris for the Merkle week from March 9th to 12th. And remember, all you listeners in the UK, that's only a two hour trip on the Eurostar, so don't miss out. So get your tickets over at MerkleWeek.com and be sure to use the promo code Epicenter at the top of the checkout page uh, for 30% off your early bird tickets. And that offer is valid until March 3rd. So we'd like to thank the Merkle week and Eureka certification for their support of Epicenter. We're going to park the topic of DAOs for the time being, only to pick it up later towards the end of the show. While the DAO fork was perhaps not intended for, the what you are intending for is a fork to move Ethereum from proof of work today to proof of stake. So let's let's kind of move into a discussion on why why that's the plan. Right. So recently you published this article, which which was called uh, which outlined your proof of stake design philosophy. Right. And uh, in, in, in that article, you, you laid out for basically the grounds for at least attempting the move to proof of stake. So can you explain why, why you want to take such a transition in a network that is live and has over a billion dollars in value? Sure. So I would say proof of stake has a couple of major advantages. So the one that people bring up a lot is uh, that it really reduces uh, one of the biggest weaknesses of proof of work, which is the very uh, large and kind of inefficient uh, hardware cost and electricity consumption. So you know, if you look at something like uh, the Bitcoin network, like it burns hundreds of millions of dollars a year in uh, capital depreciation costs, the electricity costs, some ma maintenance costs, all. Uh, to uh, maintain this network and the computations that these miners are doing like they're basically just kind of pointless busy work right they're just problems that are created for the sake of being hard and you know it's like it's not really providing any kind any kind of extra value to society it's basically just doing this sort of busy work for the purpose of proving to the Bitcoin network that the, mi the miner capable of doing the basic work exists and isn't like some kind of, uh, some kind of civil attacker. And uh, I mean, personally, I've never really been comfortable with like that aspect of either Ethereum or Bitcoin. And uh, I've been always kind of interested in seeing, you know, are there solutions? Are there ways to kind of reduce the inefficient energy consumption? And back in 2013, I was really interested in various things like proof of storage, useful proof of work, which is the idea of coming up with a proof of work algorithm that simultaneously does various forms of scientific computation. You, like you could imagine a, a proof of work that like simultaneously does some kind of machine learning or 
you know, protein folding or whatever. Like there are ideas around like proof of excellence, which involves like coming up with uh, proofs of uh, like uh, humans trying to solve like mathematical problems or like other things that are difficult for humans to solve. And like there are various other ideas. And uh, eventually, I kind of came to realize that proof of stake is just like the simplest and most feasible one. So that's uh, one argument. And I mean, it's also important to note that the ar this kind of argument of avoiding waste actually has two sides to it, right? One of them is just the kind of social arguments that wasting electricity is bad, wrecking the environment is bad, and so forth. And uh, I mean, on the environmental side, I'd probably say that uh, the yeah, in in external environmental costs of hardware uh, manufacturing are from something that's underappreciated and maybe even worse than the external costs of uh, the electricity consumption. But the second side of the coin is that if you're not expending as many resources on your consensus algorithm, then that means that the protocol does not have to issue as many coins. And that means that the uh, kind of cryptocurrency and a blockchain protocol can be more deflationary, right? And like in general, people kind of like that. Uh, well, hmm. yeah, like there is, uh, I mean, it, there's definitely a trade off because, like, my, you know, if uh, you don't have any block rewards, at least in the context of proof of work, then, you know, you don't have enough security to run the blockchain. But at the same time, like, if uh, you can come up with a way to have higher levels of security and not increase issuance, then that's something that most people are willing to take. So that's one side. The other side, which is also interesting, is that my opinion is that proof of stake blockchains actually are more secure against kind of like very large and serious attackers. And the argument that I raise here is that uh, with proof of work, like, okay, you know, you, there is some cost to producing more ASICs than the rest of the network combined and um, using those ASICs to pull off a 51% attack. Right, and that cost is like somewhere around two hundred million dollars. Now, the problem is that uh, there's if you can do that, then for a fairly small additional increment in cost, you can do what I call a spawn camping attack, which is basically an attack where you attack fifty one percent attack the blockchain, then as soon as it starts recovering, you fifty one percent attack it again, and then you fifty one percent attack it again, and so forth. And the end result is that you basically destroy all the trust in the system. Now, generally, when you bring this up to uh, you know people like Bitcoin Core developers, they say, "Oh, well, if that starts happening, then you know we can just hard fork to a new kind of proof of work, and we can basically make all those ASICs useless." But the problem is then, okay, let's say I'm a, an attacker who has like two hundred fifty million dollars or whatever enough resources to spawn camp Bitcoin once. Well. Once you move away from ASICs and then onto general purpose hardware, then I can probably spend another like hundred million dollars. Like it's gonna be less than two fifty because like the hardware accumulation is gonna start from scratch. But let's say I'll, I'll probably be willing to spend another hundred million dollars to fifty one percent attack and spawn camp Bitcoin again. Now the problem is though, is that the second time around, you, you can't hard fork to a different proof of work algorithm anymore because the second time around everyone is mining with general purpose hardware. And so if you do an, an other, more hard forks, then like the spawn camping attack is gonna be able to continue. So the conclusion of this basically is that realistically, there actually is a finite cost that a well-resourced attacker can pay to essentially kill off a proof of work blockchain for good, right? And in my opinion, this is actually quite unsettling, right? And uh, Look, my opinion is that one of the uh, really nice things about the kind of cypherpunk spirit in general is that it focuses on this idea of like attack defense asymmetry in cryptography, right? So, like if you look at kind of systems, you know, like, you know, the world in general right now, the cost of attack is generally much lower than the cost of defense, right? Building a building costs five million dollars. Making an IED to blow it up might cost you know less than fifty thousand. And uh, like most kind of adversarial environments in the world actually operate in this way. But with a few exceptions, 
And one of the major exceptions actually is cryptography. You know, like one of the really nice things about cryptography is that like I personally can sign messages with a public key. And I can do this at a very low cost. You know, the like signature costs like 0 0.0001 cents worth of electricity to produce. But uh, the cost of actually cracking that signature is so large that, you know, not even a major national government stands in, even a chance of doing it. And like, that's something that's like extremely powerful. And, uh, but, you know, that kind of cypherpunk spirit, if you look at uh, proof of work consensus systems, it doesn't carry over like at all, right? So the, the cost of attacking a proof of work blockchain is always necessarily going to be less than the cost of defending it. And like, it can't be more. And the, the reason basically is that, you know, if you want to 51% attack a blockchain, then that means you have to have spent more on hardware plus electricity than everyone else combined. But then, you know, oh wait, that already means that if you can spend more money attacking than the network has spent defending, then you can win. And realistically, you can spend much less because like a large portion of those electricity costs have already been spent and you don't and you're never gonna see them again. So the nice thing about proof of stake is that I feel like it actually does come close to replicating this kind of cypherpunk spirit because you, instead of having this kind of spawn camping vulnerability, you know, sure, someone can 51% attack a proof of stake blockchain. Okay, fine. Now, w one of the key properties that we're trying to design into Casper is this idea of what I call auditable Byzantine fault tolerance, which actually does go a bit beyond Byzantine fault tolerance because auditable Byzantine fault tolerance do doesn't just say, you know, if the network broke, that means that more than one third of the nodes are Byzantine. It actually means if the network breaks, then b more than one third of the nodes are Byzantine and you know who to blame, right? So you have cryptographic proof that you can use in order to show that, you know, oh, you know, these know, these validators are the ones that were responsible for the 51% attack. And what you can do is you can just like coordinate a hard fork on the community level and you can just like continue the chain and those validators can get their deposits destroyed and you, and you just keep going from there, right? So the cost of the attacker would be something like, you know, a hundred million dollars worth of ether of like all these deposits that got burned. But the cost of the network would basically just be, oh, hey, it's just an unexpected hard fork. Like, it, it would maybe be two or three times as bad as what, what would happen if, uh, or what happened back in November when uh, we had that uh, consensus failure between GIF and Parity. But, like, it's not that much worse, right? Like, okay, you know, people would uh, know what happened. People know what to expect. You know, the blockchain would need to continue. The, these validators would get slashed and life goes on. And sure, the attacker can keep on attacking it again and again, but you know the attacker would have to buy another 10 million ether and keep on doing this each and every time, right? So the equation is really tilted in favor of the defender here. And like I would even say one of the uh, other nice properties of this kind of approach is that because such a system would be able to just like honey badger recover from 51% uh, attack so well, I would argue that a 51% attack would actually increase the value of the underlying cryptocurrency because people would realize, oh, wait, you know, the, it's, the, there's an attacker in this and uh, suddenly a bunch of ether got burned and so uh, the, the rest of it is going to be worth more, right? So because of that, I think like you, the process of even trying to buy up enough ether to pull the attack off would end up kind of ironically enough increasing the price. So like a uh, kind of conjecture is that people would realize this and that basically no one would even try like doing at least that kind of attack vector at all. And uh, people would focus their, their energies on relatively cheaper attack vectors like, uh, like finding software bugs in operating systems that let them like hack into people's computers or you know, whatever else people can do now. So like that's the general thing that we're trying to go towards. I mean, there's also, obviously a lot of uh, kind of specific things that we wanted to do. So look, one of the uh, things that we've been doing a lot in the last probably four months is we've been making a really serious effort at trying to uh, understand kind of abstractly incentive compatibility in the context of uh, crypto economic protocols. 
So just think in like a very abstract sense, you know, how given any protocol, kind of how would you think about figuring out how to incentivize uh, the participants? And the thing that we realized is that the, we, we came up with a method or like a, a combination of a couple of methodologies, right? Where like one of them is this notion of auditable fault tolerance, where you would try to create systems where if the system breaks and you absolutely know who is at fault and you know that they unambiguously did something bad, then you can just like destroy their entire deposit, right? Because you know you can you know that they did something bad and you can penalize them. If, and if you're going to penalize them, you might as well penalize them right all the way to to the max. Now, that's one side of it, right? And designing consensus algorithms that have this uh, auditable BFT property is uh, something that's fairly important. Now, another um, interesting um, situation that we came up with is what if you have a situation where some validator or some participant in a consensus protocol caused the consensus protocol to either fail or have reduced performance, but you don't know exactly which one. Let's say that you can nail it down to one of two. Then the approach that we ended up uh, converging on is, in that case, you penalize both. Right? So if you can nail it down to one of n, you penalize all n of them. Now, the reason why this is nice is because, like, first of all, it achieves this nice incentive compatibility property. And um, it also has the really good side benefit of being a very effective uh, fix or, or mitigation against things like selfish mining. Right? Because, like, basically, you can show that if you follow this methodology, then any um, deviation from optimal protocol behavior and by optimal protocol behavior, like imagine in like something like the Bitcoin or the Ethereum blockchain, you know, miners just always creating blocks, one right on top of the previous, right on top of the previous, no stales, no uncles, just like a straight chain. Like you can show that if you follow this methodology when you design your incentives, then any deviation from optimal behavior will not be profitable to anyone. Like it will lead to anyone who might be at fault losing money, right? And so, you know, if you follow this approach, then all uh, these kind of large classes of attacks become something that you don't really have to worry about anymore. And this is a methodology that you could apply to proof of work, you could apply to proof of stake, like you could apply in a lot of contexts. This is the methodology of incentive compatibility you're referring to. Well, I mean, incentive compatibility is like a generic game theoretic term that just basically means, you know, the mechanism encourages uh, like, uh, validators or like participants to act in ways that are that kind of promotes the goal that you that you wants to have, but this is our methodology at trying to achieve incentive compatibility. So this is obviously super exciting, and I I very much agree that uh, proof of work security model is kind of flawed. And if you think in the longer term, it's really unclear how Bitcoin is going to be secure. We did yesterday, or we recorded an episode with. Um, about you know Bitcoin fee market and unlimited and how that's going to work, but I think what's clear there, right, is that uh, it's it's very unclear how that's going to work. Um, but what's the, what's the timeline here? When do we actually expect uh, Casper to be implemented, and what do you see as some of the risks? Ian, I'm guessing right now, like. Uh... It, like it's hard to tell, but like start of next year seems like possible. Um, like in general, the kind of pipeline that we have to go through, right, is uh, step one: finalize the algorithm. Step two: make a test network, and simultaneously we do a bunch of like academic uh, verification and auditing of the algorithm. Step three: once we're happy with it, implement it across all seven of the clients. Then probably run another test that for uh, with it for like three or four months, and then finally release. Right. So like each of those uh, stages is something that takes time, could potentially have delays, has its own issues. Just as you know, we went to, went through when we were launching Frontier back in twenty fifteen, and uh, you know each one of those stages uh, has like some risks to it. Um, I feel like right now we're getting close to the point where. The uh, research and like algorithm specification stage is uh, kind of coming close to resolution. Now, uh, I mean, I know you had Rick on your show, and like uh, the, I know that was uh, definitely a great episode, and he talked a lot about some other fancy Casper features, like uh, 
like, like subjective consensus and uh, like various other things that he and Vlad were thinking about. So one of the challenges is going to be is that we're going to have to come up with a red line where we basically say, this is a subset of features that we're happy with for now. And, you know, uh, so, uh, some of us are going to focus on getting this into Ethereum and like making sure that the real ne uh, like live networks can benefit from it as soon as possible. You know, obviously subject to like safety constraints and so forth. And at the same time, continue research on that of can we improve Casper and like make it have more and more of these nice properties over time. And like those are two tracks that have been uh, kind of starting to happen in parallel already. But and you know I expect are definitely probably going to continue happening. So like in general, I think like, our research, especially in the longer term, is fairly kind of multi-threaded. Where you know you have like some myself researching some aspects of Casper on one side, Vladry researching some aspects of Casper on his side, then some research on sharding happening. Then some research on protocol economics. So then some like you know things like uh, making correct incentives for managing uh, contract storage size and general kind of state size, account creation, account deletion, um, privacy, you know zero knowledge proofs, and like all of those other issues. So like all of those are things that we're kind of thinking about at the same time. I mean, any of them I think have the risk that it ends up being a much harder problem than we thought. Um. On the once we get to uh, testing, I mean, I think it's definitely going to be a challenge to um, actually uh, develop the test network, like uh, run it, make sure that it does everything to our satisfaction. Like that's all of general, more of a kind of software development and engineering challenge, and then implementing it across all seven clients, like running the test and so forth. That's another set of challenges. I mean, look. Once uh, the yeah, we're confident to build the algorithm itself, none of the rest is like has that much fundamental uncertainty in it. It's basically just this kind of fairly long and kind of and uh, kind of incremental slog that might take less time and might take more time. Today's magic word is stake. That's S T A K E. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. One of the terms that uh, one hears uh, related to Casper is this idea of consensus by bet, right? Uh, so, so, so generally, like the way I tend to think is, once you have a system where you can define a set of public keys as validators of some some form, a lot of systems end up taking the approach that they go to traditional Byzantine fault tolerance literature, right? Uh, like. You have consensus algorithms like practical Byzantine fault tolerance and the families that are derived from there. And so once you have validators defined, you can use all of these traditional algorithms to implement consensus. But with Casper, one hears of this new idea, which is called, which is consensus by bet. And what we'd like to know is what is consensus by bet? And is this a point of focus for you right now? So the general idea behind consensus by bet is basically that you can think of uh, validator signatures as being commitments that say, I am willing to get some reward in, ch in hi a history that has property X, where property X might say, you know, it contains some particular block or it contains some particular state root in exchange for uh, undergoing some penalty in all chains that do not contain X. And... The theory basically is that you can kind of both mimic proof of work in, and including resolving proof of work's nothing at stake issues and potentially go even further by basically having a consensus algorithm that consists of validators having the opportunity to make these kinds of bets, right? And like in the original formulation, you can think of a bet as basically saying plus X in chains where that contain, let's say, some state root S and uh, minus Y in chains that do not contain that state root. And you can think of uh, validators as having the ability to make these bets at different odds, where you can think of the odds as being like the ratio between the X to the Y. So for example, if X is one and Y is um, a penalty of uh, sort of minus one, then 
it would make sense to make that bet if you think that S has at least a 50% chance of being in the uh, history that ends up winning. But if you get a bet that's that uh, has you know X being plus 4 and S being minus 16, then that would only make sense when you think there's an 80% chance. And so the idea is that you give the validators the opportunity to make these bets, and uh, they would uh, start making those bets. Now, initially, you know, there might be a, a fork, there might be, a, or there might be like a choice. You know, do you choose state root S or do you choose state root T? Initially, validators would be fairly confused. They might only make 50-50 bets in one direction or the other. But eventually, once it becomes clear which one's winning, validators would be able to make bets with like progressively higher and higher odds on one of them. And eventually, they'd be willing to make bets at maximum odds that basically say, in exchange for a medium reward in history containing S, I am willing to lose all my money in all histories that do not contain S. So they just like fully commit their money to this particular chain. And that's when you know that that particular uh, 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 chain or uh, like up to that particular checkpoint is kind of quote finalized. So that was the original idea. Now, we have been recently de-emphasizing that and uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one of them is that people in general are not comfortable with, or at least not fully comfortable with taking on this kind of risk that, oh, you know, what if something really, really unexpected happens? And what if I made some bets that were 99.9% .9 confident, but it turns out I was wrong and now I suddenly lose a bunch of money? So, you know, it does impose extra risks on validators and validators would have to be compensated for those risks. So that was one concern. The other concern is that one of the properties that we're trying to keep in our algorithms is this notion of bounding the griefing factor. So what I mean by that is that like the, the, the griefing factor is basically like a, a coefficient that says, you know, how easy is it to maliciously attack other validators in the system? So if the griefing factor is five, then what that means is that there exist ways for malicious actors to spend one dollar in order to make some t some target lose five dollars. If the um, griefing factor is, let's say, one half, then that means that the malicious actors would have to spend two dollars to make the honest actors lose one dollar. And what I realized is that if you assume an attacker that controls the majority of the stake, then the griefing factor on this kind of system could, in some models, potentially be, end up being very high basically because uh, look, the uh, validators would start kind of expanding, pushing out to infinity or, or pushing out their bets to, toward kind of infinite, infinite odds on one side, and then you would suddenly come kind of with overwhelming odds and kind of flip the uh, bet, the, the winning uh, kind of uh, state over to some other answer. And then all of a sudden, it, it looks like there's consensus happening around the other answer, but then there's people that made all their bets in the original direction, and they all end up losing a bunch of money. So like for several reasons, we ended up uh, de-emphasizing that approach. And the approach that we're thinking of right now, actually, is uh, one that is much closer to a traditional Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithms, except that with uh, a few different uh, kind of changes to the algorithms and a few changes to the security model. Right? So one of the changes to the security model, for example, is that we don't just care about fault tolerance, we care about auditable fault tolerance. I mean, there's also like a slightly different definition of liveness. There's also a few other small changes, but like that's roughly the approach that we're looking at. So that's very interesting that you're, you're looking now more towards uh, traditional Byzantine fault tolerance literature. Um, in order to finalize a consensus algorithm. I thought uh, one other difference that that struck me as uh, as unique in, in Casper is that in, in, in much of the traditional Byzantine fault tolerance literature, uh, BBFT, those systems prioritize consistency over availability. So what that means is in, in, case, the, in case there's a network partition, for example, let's say the communication with China is broken off, China and the West is broken off. Then if it's Bitcoin, blocks will keep on producing on the Western side and the Chinese side. So that is a system that prioritizes availability over consistency. System is still available, but you have two different blockchains now. And then traditional Byzantine fault tolerance literature, many consensus algorithms are 
they prioritize consistency over availability, which means no new blocks will be produced. So the system grinds to a halt, but the blockchain doesn't fork. Now, now, now with Casper, what I keep uh, hearing uh, is that you want to prioritize availability over consistency. Can you like walk us through why you are making that choice and what part of traditional literature fits that kind of description? Sure. So, and the main reason I'd say why we care about availability is because, I mean, first of all, in a public blockchain context, like one third of validators just dropping offline at the same time is a very real possibility. Like, for the partitions could happen. No, it could just get lazy. Like, lots of things could happen. And saying that if that happens, then the network just like halts is unacceptable. So, people, we just really want to have this property that of like maintaining what proof of work has, where, you know, as long as there are at least some nodes that, that wants to keep the chain going, the chain keeps going. Now, then of course, there's a question of like, how does that end kind of mesh together with uh, traditional BFT algorithms, which are, as you say, consistency favoring. And uh, there's kind of two general approaches to kind of combining the two. So in general, I would describe Casper as being an availability favoring algorithm that also tells you how much consistency you have, right? So the kind of nice thing of uh, about that definition is that you know in some sense you do have kind of as much of both as you can get, um, you know, or, or as much of both as you know the like, things like the CAB theorem allow you to have, but and uh, the uh, way that this ends up working is. That well, so once again, one of two approaches where one of them is that you have some base algorithm that is availability favoring. So, for example, if you look at like a lot of the older proof of stake algorithms that like rely on this notion of like proof of work style validators making blocks on top of each other, that like that is availability favoring, right? Like that keeps going even if there's only one percent of the nodes that are offline, but it doesn't have any notion of finality. And then basically, you take this availability favoring backbone and you would kind of layer a consistency favoring finality layer on top of it. And the idea would be that if you have more than two thirds of nodes that are online, then b both things would work and you know, you'd have your availability, you'd have your consistency. Now, if more than a third of nodes drop offline, then the uh, consistency favoring uh, 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 finality layer would just stop finalizing. You know, it will repeatedly try and try and try again, and it would fail every time, but the availability favoring chain would keep on going. And what this means is that the chain keeps going, but clients on the, ch that, like users that use the chain and even applications, like even smart contracts that are sitting on the chain would all be aware of the fact that they were sitting on a chain which suddenly has lower guarantees of security at least past some particular point. And they would be able to like make, to make their own judgments about how they interpret that. So basically like individual applications would almost be able to choose what their own trade-offs between consistency and availability are. Now, the second approach, it has similar properties, but instead of having two separate mechanisms, it has one mechanism. And in that one mechanism, you would have what's called a subjective finality threshold. So if a subjective finality threshold basically means that instead of having a fixed, like hard uh, in-protocol threshold of like, for example, it, you need to have two thirds of like of all nodes sign up prepare in order for anyone to start signing a commit. You would try to like make all of those things endogenous, or or you would make all those things just like be choices that get made by validators or get made by users. And so individual users would pick kind of like how many prepares they're satisfied by, how many commits they're satisfied by, and the idea here would be that if let's say all of a sudden 40% of nodes drop offline, and if there's common knowledge of this, or if there's approximate common knowledge of this, then the chain can actually keep finalizing things in the sense that you have this guarantee that says that as long as the 40% that are offline actually are offline, then you know people can lower their finality thresholds, and within that context, you can finalize things. So we have a guarantee that says, you know, either things uh, like the chain keeps on going consistently as before, 
that sounds uh, really uh, really cool know that you have kind of both of those advantages right that on the one hand applications know what's going on and there can be risk assessments made and you know exchanges know okay we have to be careful we have to wait we have to wait for extra confirmation etc cetera, etc cetera. but at the same time uh the chain keeps going uh, even when there's petitions even when there's all kinds of issues i think that really kind of combines the best of both worlds i'm really excited to hear that that's uh, possible and that's the direction that um, you guys are taking here let's take a short break to talk about jax jax is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at the central now in the past if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies it was a pain to handle them you either had to leave them on an exchange which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies, and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J A X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. Let's move on to, to another topic that we wanted to cover. So you wrote a really nice uh, short paper, a 30 page paper or something. Uh, for R3 about uh, chain interoperability. And now chain interoperability, I think, is a topic that's become uh, much more uh, present, much more, uh, much more attention on that. Uh, we have a whole bunch of projects in this space. I mean, there's, uh, of course, uh, Ripple with Interledger that has been uh, working on this area for a long time. There's also some more novel uh, proposals, like uh, the Polkadot proposal by uh, the ETHCore, uh, team and and then also the one I, I am partially involved in, which is the, the Cosmos uh, Cosmos proposal. So there's a whole bunch of different ones. So would you mind us uh, running us through just what what are the the main challenges uh, and approaches to making uh, blockchains really interoperable so that one can you know move value seamlessly around, build applications that maybe involve uh, components that live on different blockchains. Sure. Um, so, in general, there, you know, as I described in the paper, there's uh, several kind of major ways that you can achieve interoperability, and there's several major categories of things that you can use interoperability for. And like you can think of those, look, there's also different ways of making the categorization. So there's the kind of more computer science theoretic characterization, which is about what kinds of relationships between events on chain A and events on chain B do you want to create? And then there is the more uh, kind of application uh, layer one of, you know, what exactly are you even using this for? So uh, then there's uh, the kind of various different technologies, right? So first they talk about notary schemes, which are basically a kind of multi-sig uh, federations. And that's a trust model that's fairly simple to understand. You know, if you trust the majority of the people in the federation, then you can kind of trust that federation to say what happened here, what happened here. If something happens here, do something there. If something happens there, do something here. Then the second model I uh, describe is this concept of hash locking, which is a generalization of the tier known protocol from you know the Bitcoin kind of forums back in 2012 and 2013. And uh, the uh, idea behind hash locking is basically you use this kind of scheme where you make an event A, or you make an event on chain A and an event on chain B both be dependent on someone revealing a secret number that has some particular hash. And the idea is that if the number gets revealed, then you know either party would be able to paste the number in and make things happen on both chains. And if that number doesn't get revealed, then you know neither of those things can happen. And if you try to make the event happen on one side of the chain, then the process of doing that reveals a secret number until the other party can take the secret number and kind of transplant it into a transaction on the other chain. So it's this fairly kind of simple technique, um, and it can do quite a lot. So it can do cross-chain exchanges, for example, but it does have one major limitation. And the way that I describe the limitation is that it can't do, like, 
it can do what I call cross-dependency, but it can't do what I call causation, right? So a cross-dependency basically says you make an event on chain A and an event on chain B both be dependent on some other event C. And in this case, C is like revealing, the, revealing some secret number. But what they can't do is make an event on chain A generally cause an event on chain B, right? So for example, in particular, if there's an event on chain A that's not caused by an individual, it's caused by smart contracts, then you know smart contracts can't keep secrets, and so this protocol can't really even work at all, right? So in those cases, you have to move beyond uh, hash locking into other constructions. And like the third ma major category of technology that I talk about is relays. And you know we already have BTC Relay for about a year, which is basically a Bitcoin light client that lives inside of the Ethereum blockchain. So Ethereum contracts can verify Bitcoin transactions and they can do things conditional on Bitcoin transactions taking place. And this allows for this other kind of kind of causal interoperability between the Bitcoin blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain, where events on the Bitcoin blockchain can directly trigger events on the Ethereum blockchain. So I talk about uh, all, all three of those technologies in depth. I talk about like what you can do with causality and what you can do with cross-dependency. So for example, with cross-dependency, you can do cross-chain exchange, but you can't move assets across chains. So like you can't do the equivalent of a side chain, but with uh, causality, you can basically do everything. Um, and, you know, I talk about side chains. I, I talk about kind of FedCoin you know, like in private, uh, chain contexts. I uh, talk about uh, like, uh, making uh, contracts uh, or smart contracts in one chain that are connected to assets in another chain and various other use cases. One of one of the things you were writing about in there, an observation you made in your paper that I thought was very interesting, was your point that you know as soon as you start moving assets between chains, there's always a little bit of a you know a little bit of a risk there, right? So uh, there might be some attack vectors or something can be suppressed, or one chain DDoS, or or you know maybe just one chain gets. 51% attack. So there's all kinds of things. And so in a way that the, the security of those assets can get, uh, you know, a little bit weakened, and maybe it's not as strong on, on the chain where they move to as opposed to the chain where they originated on. So what I'm curious about is what, what kind of, if we look really far in the future, and if you think of uh, thousands and thousands of assets issued on blockchains, and, and there being kind of seamless exchange between all kinds of uh, assets, do you see, uh, do you think those will be issued in lots of different chains that tend to be controlled by maybe the parties responsible for the asset? Or do you think that this, this issue of moving uh, assets and uh, uh, around chains is, is big enough that there will be a strong incentive to you know, issue maybe many of them on, on, on some chains and central chains that... Um, maybe have a lot of security and, and then moving others on, maybe onto those chains or onto third chains, but that there's a sort of uh, an effect that we have assets and asset issuance and management concentrate on a few chains. Do you think we, we will see that? I think, I mean, first of all, you have to distinguish between different types of assets. So for example, you have issuer backed assets, and then you have kind of pure cryptographic assets like Bitcoin and Ether. And one of the things with issuer backed assets is that there is an issuer, and if there's an incentive to do it, then the issuer can just issue the uh, many different versions of the asset on just about every chain that they care to support, right? Like you can issue, you know, the like gold-backed tokens on Ethereum, on Counterparty, on Ripple, on NXT, on BitShares, and like on any system that supports like people being able to issue tokens at the same time. And realistically, you might as well do that for any system where, you know, the potential revenues for the issuer are greater than the costs of like basically uh, doing the integration and uh, teaching their uh, customer support staff how to handle that particular chain. So that's uh, something that I think issuers definitely are going to do. Now, in the case of cryptographic assets, obviously, you can't do that. And I think there are going to be some situations where... Like you don't want every cryptographic asset issuer to actually be in the business of you know keeping track of and uh, supporting all of these chains necessarily. And I think especially for smaller chains, 
the yeah, approach of like using sidechain like techniques where you actually do have like portable assets and you can kind of move them from chain A to chain B and then back to chain A. I, I mean, I expect that to be a paradigm that does end up having some merit. Although, in general, I think there are going to be a lot, like large categories of assets that just have one home chain get used on that one home chain and no one really tries transplanting them anywhere. Okay. And, and so we, we just did an episode about the uh, Cosmos as well. And, you know, uh, the architecture of Cosmos is that there's kind of this hub, which is connected through essentially side chains to all kinds of other chains. So do you think that's a, a model that will see traction that makes sense? Or do you think it will be more about having maybe bilateral connections between all kinds of different chains and not having this, you know, almost um, central hub or sort of a decentral hub, I guess, uh, in the middle. So I think one very specific area where a kind of decentralized cross-chain solution is really needed and, and is really going to have a lot of value is specifically exchange between cross-chain assets, right? So I don't even, I don't mean proper, uh, portability, I specifically mean like trading A for B, like or Ether for Dogecoin or whatever. The reason basically is that, you know, right now we have centralized exchanges for that. Centralized exchanges get hacked easily. They have fee, the fairly high fees. They uh, have all, all sorts of annoyances to them. And it would be really nice if we could just like have a decentralized solution, right? So I think that's something that could be potentially very promising if done well. And I mean, I don't expect there to be one solution there to rule them all there. I expect people to try coming up with various different solutions and like some of them taking off in some contexts. Uh, I mean, to some extent, there are network effects here because, you know, if you have one system, then it'd be, it's much easier to connect your more blockchains to that one system than it is to make an entire one use system from scratch. But at the same time, you know, you have things like BTC Relay that can just focus on one link and do it well. So... And I think we'll see some of both. Cool. Um, so I, I, yeah, the Internet of Blockchains is going to be like I think one of the one of the big themes in the future, and remains to be seen how exactly it it plays out. Whether it's a hub and spoke model or chains interacting directly with BTC BTC relay. Moving on from that topic, I'd like to jump to the theme of applications. Now, I think I think a few months back you wrote a blog article in which uh, you laid out your view on what applications are going to what things blockchain technology is going to be good for right and you had this idea of uh, that blockchain technology would be won't have very large killer apps but will enable a long tail of small applications so i would like to uh revisit that idea and perhaps have it have you explain that idea in your own words first and i'll just uh, quickly answer so i mean first it's important to note that uh, the reason why ethereum exists in the first place and why i started working on it is because i realized that there is such a large number of different blockchain applications that you you can't just create a blockchain protocol just for every single one of them and like you can't Try and like explicitly target applications one by one and try and like target a feature for each one. The only way that you could really target the generality is by taking the Ethereum approach and just creating a programming language, right? So I would say the idea for Ethereum even by itself started with this uh, kind of vision of uh, a very diverse array of blockchain applications that are all kind of uh, fairly uh, individually uh, individually perhaps not significant enough to be worth their own blockchain, but collectively very important. So I uh, started realizing that, you know, there's uh, all these different kinds of applications and after I, Ethereum, uh, kind of the Ethereum project uh, kind of became public and as people started discovering more and more things that you could do with it, that opinion that I had just kind of kept on growing. And at some point, I realized that, you know, if people ask me, what is the killer app of Ethereum? I just realized there aren't really any good candidates. And then, you know, if I started asking my, the question of, wait, but if there aren't any killer apps, then, you know, doesn't that mean that Ethereum is worthless? And, that, and then I realized that, you know, oh, wait, you know, it's uh, like the uh, ideas that Ethereum brings in are, and 
the implementation of those ideas is valuable, but the value doesn't come from any one single application. The value comes from all the applications put together and the interactions between them. And so, you know, it's about the fact that you can have digital assets on the blockchain and you can have your company shares be on the blockchain. And once you have a digital asset on the blockchain and you have company shares on the blockchain, then all of a sudden it becomes trivial to do, let's say, an equity crowdfunding by just like doing a smart contract that automatically issues shares in exchange for digital, like, let's say, like Digix Gold or like some US dollar, blockchain based US dollars or whatever. And, you know, if you look at identity ma management on the blockchain, if you look at like, certificate revocation on the block on, on Ethereum, and like all of these different use cases, you start realizing that like all of them really do seriously complement each other. And like the killer app in some sense is this kind of combined vision of like all these things working together that like some of us call Web 3.0. Yeah, I would agree with that. Maybe with the one addition that money and and the sort of digital gold and and electronic cash may be a kind of a killer app on its own, even without those other things. Although, of course, those other things also enhance the the utility and power of of that. Would you see that the same way? I'd agree. I mean, I think the the uh, addition of uh, the economic layer to the kinds of the, the set of things that you could can do in a decentralized way is a, is a very important and fundamental well vitalik we, we are kind of at the at the time limit and we had a lot of other stuff we wanted to talk about actually we want to talk about sharding and we want to talk about ck snarks and how those are coming to ethereum uh, so we won't have the time this time, but hopefully we can we can have you on uh, again soon uh, to do that. I also hope that uh, the recording worked out well because there was a little bit of connectivity issues, but hopefully with the local recording, it should be uh, fine. So uh, thanks so much, Vitalik, for coming on. And thanks so much for our listeners for, for tuning in once again. So Epicent is part of Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can find this show and other shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. And if you want to support the show, you can do that by leaving us an iTunes review. That helps new people find the show and is very much appreciated. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.